Okay, hello everyone. Um, I got the ungrateful task of being right after lunch, so I don't know if half of you are going to be asleep or not. Hopefully not, you get some, uh, some coffee. Um, oh yeah, the clicker. Um, my name is Vasa Vojko, I come from Slovenia, and I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of Irio. <clears throat> and the organizers asked me to uh, come here and share our experience with um, funding your blockchain project um, in 2018. <clears throat> and, and I'm sorry, I seem to be losing my voice the entire day, and I swear it wasn't because I was partying yesterday, I was in bed at 10 o'clock, uh, but I don't know what it is, the um, salty air or something. <clears throat> um, so they asked me to talk about how to fund your, uh, fund a, I guess, bro blockchain project in 2018, and what's funny is that um, Erio was supposed to have an ICO in the end of March. Uh, we postponed that and we're gonna have it in June, July, sort of. Uh, so I can't really give you the entire ICO experience now because some part of it is still waiting for us. Uh, but as they say, if you don't know how to do it yourself, then teach others how to do it. And that's half of what I'm doing today. Um, just really briefly about Erio. It's not an Erio pitch. Um, I'm gonna be talking about other things, but um, just so you know where we come from, um, Irio is a healthcare IT startup that is solving the problem of um, securely and transparently uh, storing, aggregating, and exchanging healthcare data, uh, which is a much bigger problem than it maybe seems at first glance. Um, and we're using a couple of new innovative technologies to do that, uh, one of them being blockchain. Um, and as things are today, if you're using blockchain, then it's almost natural to do an ICO, so that's how we got into this space, and we started Irio at the end of last summer, um, and so we've been busy at work for the past uh, nine months or so. Uh, but I wanted to start with going back a bit with, with ICOs and, and how you know, ICOs got started, because um, that's really, usually when they ask you what's gonna happen in the future, nobody knows, and then we go back and we study that really hard, and we kind of hope that that's gonna help us predict the future. It never does, but we still do it. Um, so it's probably all the stuff that I'm gonna say for the future, I might be 100% wrong, um, but well, we'll see. <clears throat> um, so the whole ICO thing started in about 2013, and there was this guy, really smart guy, um, called Naval Radikant. He made this um, comment, or he wrote this down in March 2014, I'm just gonna read it out for you. Um, Bitcoin is more than money and more than a protocol. It's a model and a platform for true crowdfunding. Open, distributed, and liquid all the way. That is sort of the legend about the ICO, right? Um, and then there's the second thing that he said, which is prior to Bitcoin, you had to raise money, write software, distribute your product, build a business model, work towards liquidity. And you were doing that through um, these oracles that were um, getting rents in, on the way that we're getting money for that, and those oracles are called angel investors, VCs, investment banks, um, and so on and so on. And so it sort of implies that with this new great crowdfunded model, um, none of this is needed. And sometimes even writing software and distributing the product is not needed, um, unfortunately. Uh, but anyway, um, the birth of the ICO. Um, what made this possible is the development of the digital infrastructure, uh, obviously the blockchain networks, that make it possible to issue tokens, okay? And the tokens really simply um, are a digital asset that can be transferred in a completely permissionless way, and the good thing about it is they can't be copied and they can't be counterfeited, right? Um, and because of all of that, because it's permissionless, because it's open, because it runs 24 seven, it can be sold, sold and bought and created by anyone at any time in any place. And so there's a couple of things that happen as a consequence of that. If you just look at the, uh, the States, for example, um, if you wanted to be an angel or VC investor, uh, you had to be an accredited investor, still have to be. And there's a couple of things that qualifications that you need, but one of them is that you, your net worth needs to be one million US dollars, which is a quite high barrier to entry. And so not even, and it's sort of, you had, you had to have money to be able to invest and then make more money, um, which is not the way we want things to be. Um, and with, with tokens, with ICOs, all of that went away because it was sort of 
free for all, anyone can participate. And just because the anyone could participate, the, the buyer base, I'm going to be saying buyer a lot instead of investor because um, lawyers are really jumpy if we say investors in, in ICOs, so it's all buyers. Um, the buyer base is 100 to 1,000 times larger. And the other thing is that before it sort of was limited to this, to the states and even more to Silicon Valley if you're in software. Um, and it was difficult to invest if you weren't from the US, but it was also difficult to raise money. Um, they've, they've done a research a while ago what the highest correlation is um, between VCs and the companies they invest in. And I'm not saying it's causation, but it's definitely correlation and it was if, you, if you're the same alumni, if you went to the same university, uh, which is not a good criteria. So it's, def it's probably not causation, but that's, that's the highest correlation. Um, and then it was the last thing, which is that if you do um, an ICO, if, if um, you buy tokens on the other side of that, um, you get near instant liquidity. So before you had this, in traditional VC funding, you went from the first angel investment to maybe at the end the um, IPO, if that's the end of the journey, that was maybe 10 years, 15 years. Um, and in between, it was really hard to liquidate your investment. Um, now, it's not, it's not instant in, in the ISO world, but it's nearly instant. <clears throat> so again, a bit of a history lesson. Uh, the first ISO, or again, so the legend goes, was MasterCoin August 2013. And they raised um, 5,000 Bitcoins, which in today's money is a lot of that time, is about half a million US. Um, the really famous one was the Ethereum ICO uh, that was in 2014. It raised 18 million. Still small numbers compared to what's been happening in the past couple of months. Um, then it was the famous DAO, which raised 50 million, uh, which was the largest one at that point. Um, it raised 5% of all existing Ether at that point, and then it was hacked. Um, and so that's why we had the Ethereum uh, hard fork and so on, but that's a different story. Um, and then happens 2017, and we have this big bang of ICOs. And all of a sudden, um, the ICO funding surpasses early stage VC funding. Uh, there was Tezos that, um, well, the tokens are still not out, but again, different story. They've raised over 200 million. Uh, we have EOS, which is a year-long ICO. Every day, they still, so it's still going on. Every day, they raise about 10,000 ether or more. Um, they, nobody knows how much exactly in fiat terms they've raised because, um, well, the price is volatile, but it's definitely been more than a billion. Some say they have about three billion now. Um, and so we got to a stage where we have disruptive, dem democratic, egalitarian way to raise capital. It is, again, how the legend goes. Now, I'm going to go really briefly through, through a couple of slides and some statistics, um, but I just wanted to point this out that I think that statistics um, especially when it comes to the ICOs are very inadequate and there's a lot of data missing uh, simply because of the fact that there's a lot of, um, so because it's decentralized, it's permissionless, there's no gatekeepers and so there's no gatekeepers for the data either. So the, all of the data that's reported um, is self-reported or people are, are, are trying to get the data but I think maybe more than half of the data that we're looking at is, is actually missing um, and so a lot of the stuff is estimates and projections and so on. Um, and so this, I didn't do this myself, this was um, taken from Coindesk, which is, for now, I think the best stats you can get on ICOs, um, but they're still not good, I don't think. Um, and you can clearly see here that it, you know, it was nothing. So this is all-time ICO funding together, so you're just adding it up. <clears throat> and you can see that until sort of half, half of um, 2016, it's still nothing, it's negligible, and then starts happening here and then in the, the second half of 2017 it absolutely explodes. Uh, and then it's the end of 2017 and now it's the, first, the, the end of the first quarter of 2018 and it's still going and it's still going. Um, this is the number of ICOs, so not the, the money raised, the number of ICOs and again this is I think at least half of this is missing or maybe this I think should maybe be three times as much. Um, and again you see a clear trend of 2017, um, beginning, it starts increasing and there's an, an explosion in the last quarter of 2017. Um, new ICO, monthly new ICO funding. So um, I think it was in December somewhere where it was in one month, it was more than a billion, which was here. That was the first time. Um, and then we got to over 2 billion um, 
Well, now we are where we are, but a bit more on that later. Uh, ah. Okay, um, this is another one. So this is the comparison of 2017 and, and 18. This is the total money raised. Uh, this is the number of ICOs. Now here it's a bit tricky because in this one there's already um, the Telegram ICO which is supposed to raise 1.7 billion. So if you take that one massive ICO away, we're below the 2017, but at the same time, this has all been done in, in Q1. Um, this is the entire year, this is mainly, this is Q1 to 18. Um, I think this clicker is dead. Yeah, battery. All right. <clears throat> um, and that's the last one. So we have the, the average number of um, average ICO size and number of ICOs. And, and I think this one is the most misleading of all because it's sort of assuming that the, um, the size of the ICOs is still increasing. I think it's actually decreasing, but what this is not acknowledging is that there's a lot of ICOs that are a lot smaller and not reported or the ones that fail. Um, so I think this should actually be uh, a bit different. Um, the, 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 the average size of, um, it's a good question. I think it's the, um, the yellow bar is the um, average ICO size in, in dollar terms. And then the line was the number of ICOs. Right, so to wrap the, that up. So that was sort of the ICO 1.0, 2014 until the end of 2017. And the model here was pretty straightforward. It's, you do a nonprofit foundation, the foundation issues um, tokens. Um, and the money that is raised is used to develop, uh, first of all, protocol technology. Usually it wasn't so much applications at first. Um, you're usually issuing a utility token, uh, which means utility means that the token is used to get a product or a service. It's not ownership in something. It's not the security token. Um, the software that you're building is open source, so it's all of this is, should be more or less um, a community project. Uh, because it's a non-profit, there's usually no, I'm not going to say there's no business model, but there, there usually wasn't any thinking about the revenue because you have, um, what they usually do is they would sell um, maybe 80, 90% of the tokens, hold on to 10, 20%, and the idea is that um, if the protocol, the product is successful, um, it gets used more and more, so the demand is higher, the supply is constant, and so the price of the token appreciates, and the uh, 10% of the tokens that you're holding, that keeps increasing in values, and you can slowly be selling them off throughout the years, and you can keep funding yourself. So it's not just the initial money that you raise, it's also that those tokens that you sort of have um, for, for more long term. Uh, but then, with its human nature, with everything, where there's a lot of money involved, where there's a lot of opportunities, there's a lot of people that come in with not such great intentions. And Partly it was that, partly it was other things. Some of it was maybe stupidity. Um, ICO 1.0 goes sour. Um, what started happening here was that people started slapping a, a token model onto every product and service, um, forcing blockchain layer into everything, even when it doesn't make sense. Um, software wasn't open source. It's not a community-driven project. Um, token distribution was, we went from maybe 80, 90% of the tokens sold in the ICO to 30% sold in the ICO, which means whoever is issuing them is holding on to 70%. So is that decentralized? I don't think so. Um, and then there was another thing where some people were just ignorant, some people were um, foolish in thinking that regulation is not going to get to them. Um, and that was that People weren't, so it was free for all. It was basically, here's the wallet address, and if you want to contribute, contribute. Um, nobody was doing KYC checks, so KYC know your customer, or AML, anti-money laundering procedures, stuff like that. Um, and after they raised the maybe 10 million or whatever, they realized they can't get that money onto exchanges, uh, at least not reputable exchanges, to convert it to fiat. And you needed US dollars or euros to uh, fund the development, because we're still paying for rent and food and gas in, in euros, for the most part. Um, so the capital was, couldn't get out of crypto, um, and even more than that, you couldn't get it onto a bank, because the bank would say, well, where is that, where is the origin of those funds, and nobody had any idea. 
Um, so that started happening, and then also the financial regulations uh, regulators stepped in, uh, outright banned it in a couple of countries, China, South Korea, um, in USA they said, well, you can only sell it to accredited investors, so you kind of go back around and you, st you, you, you end up where you um, started, and so on. And so the model that we've seen, I think, in the last quarter of 2017 and then Q1 of 2018 is sort of this. Um, we went from this crowdfunded model to um, 70 to 80% of the funds being raised through private deals. Private deals are called, usually called SAFT, simple agreement on uh, future tokens, which means that it's not, a, it's not egalitarian anymore, it's not democratic, it's deals that you make with private big investors, whales, one-on-one uh, -on -one in the back room, and you give them various discounts, and the discounts were usually um, 50 to 90 percent on, on the, the price that the retail um, token buyer is going to pay for um, in the crowd sale in the ICO. That was one thing. Um, and so and through those private sales, 70 to 80 percent of the, uh, the cap, whatever they were raising, um, was raised through that. Uh, for, the re for the remaining 20% that was available for the crowd sale, uh, you spend a lot of money on marketing, creating FOMO, fear of missing out, um, and then you sold those 20% on the crowd sale. And then you have these stories where, uh, you know, 10 million, 20 million was raised in five minutes. It wasn't, it was 10 or 20%. A lot of that before was raised through private deals. Um, I mean, even technically Ethereum right now, unless it comes from 10 million, comes from 10 people, the, the, the TPS of Ethereum wouldn't allow that anyway uh, to happen in a couple of minutes. Um, and so what happens is those people, the whales that, that get the, uh, the good deals, the 50 to 90% discount in private deals, then as soon as the uh, token starts floating on exchange, they dump it there, and then even if it's on nominal value, they'll get two to three times um, the original investment. Or if there's enough FOMO, there was a lot of um, buyers who wanted to get into the ICO but were left outside the door who then buy on the exchange. Um, rising the price to maybe 10, 20x, and so it's a really nice profit for the initial investors. Uh, but then again, we get back to you know, what they say for the, the IPOs and the investment banks, which is if you can get it, you don't want it. So only the, the whales, the big investors, get the good deals, the retail investor doesn't get it. Um, and so it, it kind of, to a large extent, I think started happening here as well. And then, this is also part of the reason why we postponed the ICO. And then there was a, it all went good and it was all rising, rising, rising until sort of March of 2018. Um, after January, the prices of cryptocurrency started falling. Um, and I think that the low was just in March at some point, I think. Um, and the way we experienced it, it, and I don't have data to, to sort of back this up, but I've, I've spoken to, to others who've been going through the same things and I'm pretty sure that's what happened. Um, was that there wasn't this gradual decrease in, in ICO funding. It was in um, like a week, it was a complete stop um, of very little money flowing into ICOs. And we had the scissor effect where before you could raise from one big investor, you could raise anywhere from 500 to 1,000 ether. Because of all of this uncertainty, because of the crypto prices falling, um, those commitments went down to maybe 100, 200 ether, and at the same time, when it was 500 to 1,000 ether, that was maybe 1,000 US or 1,000 or 1,500, and then it fell down to 400, 500 US dollars. So you basically went from fiat nominal value of maybe 700,000 US to 100 or 200,000. Um, and so these um, funding targets of 30, 40, 50 million sort of went half through the door. Um, and we're seeing now, I think, much smaller rounds. Now, why the data that I showed you before, I think, is a bit... Um, inaccurate is because we have this, what I call the Hollywood distribution, which is the same as the Hollywood movies, which is there's a couple of blockbuster movies every year that will get 80 to 90% of uh, the revenue, and then there's gonna be the large majority of movies being produced who are gonna be maybe just above break-even or below break-even, and I think a similar effect is happening here. You have those all-star ICOs, really big ones, um, that will get a lot of funding uh, because simply there is money out there that wants to invest, but it's only going to be in the top five projects, and that's going to be a high premium, um, and then all the rest is going to be is going to be little. And I think we're going to be seeing that in um, maybe at the end of Q2, where more data when more data comes in. And so that brings us to the question: 
what's going to happen now? How will these things change? And if that was ICO 1.0, what is then ICO 2.0? Um, there's a lot of debate here. Nobody really knows. Um, this is what I'm seeing, and I might be completely wrong. Um, so the first thing is that what I think is definitely true is that the cycles in crypto are very short. Um, so what that means is that boom and bust cycles are, are shorter. Things change a lot quicker. Uh, Domen's going to be presenting after me, talking about marketing more. And um, I'm sure that you agree that marketing is every two months, things change a lot. So what worked a year ago doesn't work a year later or even two months later. So there's a lot of changes there. Um, there's going to be legal changes. So if we went before through completely unregulated ICOs, now everyone needs to be doing KYC, AML, and that's expensive to do, and it's uh, painful. And so there's a lot of friction, and there's a lot of dropout rate, because people simply don't want to do that. They want to buy the tokens, but they don't want to do the KYC. Um, we have the utility token now not being the only type of token that you might be issuing. There's security tokens, and that actually also might I mean, all of this stuff might actually be, or probably is, a good thing in the end. It's just what the consequences will be. Um, marketing changes. So if even four months ago, you could still advertise a lot on social media, Facebook is putting a ban, kind of, on ICO marketing. Uh, Medium is getting more strict on the posts that you can publish there. Um, a year ago, if you could get a lot of organic articles in respectful publications because they were simply interested in the space, now you can't get an article published even if it's a paid promotional article. They just simply won't do it anymore. So there's a lot, so it's a lot more crypto specialized marketing. There's a lot more through telegrams, bots, that kind of stuff. Um, we see product changes, which I think is kind of natural. So we're, we're going from the protocol level up to maybe more an application level of what we're seeing um, being developed through ICO um, funded project. There's investor changes. Uh, so we're going from this completely individual uh, investors. I don't want to call them retail investors because they're relatively big, uh, but it's more institutional money coming in. So it's now the VCs that are entering the game. Um, and they're also trying to figure out um, how all of this, what, what it's going to look like, how to do deals. They don't know how to do crypto deals. And so there's a lot of we know kind of where things are going, but there's a lot of stuff to figure out legally, um, business-wise, and so on. And so also the business model is changing. If before it was nonprofit, it was all open source. Um, now, you know, you're gonna talk, if you're going to talk to institutional investors, if it's going to be VCs, even though you're doing an ICO, um, they're going to be asking you for traction. They're going to be asking you for projected revenue, um, customer acquisition cost, lifetime value of a customer, all the um, basic metrics that we have. Which is, um, I don't want to scare you with this, but I just wanted to show you this because it's funny, you, you start talking to institutional investors and they start asking you about these metrics. Um, and the crypto world doesn't have those metrics yet. Um, this is, again, stolen from DAP Radar, which is tracking the usage of uh, DAPs, distributed applications. And obviously the most, um, popular ones are the decentralized exchanges. Um, so the first one is just, I think, a, um, a paid ad. So the first one is um, IDEX. And they have um, 5,000 daily active users. And that is the most, right now, that was from yesterday, the, wide, the most popular distributed application out there is 5,000 daily active users. That is zero. Um, the next one um, is another distributed ap application. The ones that we've heard so much about, CryptoKitties, is number four, 700 daily active users. That's what we have. Um, so that's just to give you a bit of an insight that you know, we, we are talking, we're, we're starting to talk about traditional metrics, but this is where we are with traditional metrics. So expenses for an ICO 2.0. Um, I'm sure this, some of this stuff is, depends on where you are, if it's Europe or US or whatever. But just to give you a bit of an, um, again, insight into how much money is needed. And you know, when someone raises 5 million, maybe, it's not that big of a success, because maybe 2 and a half of that was already spent doing this. Um, so marketing expenses, what we're seeing now is that you need maybe it's debatable, but 150, 200K um, US at least to do a marketing campaign, and then the sky's the limit. 
Um, you can ask a marketing agency to do it, it's going to be from quarter million to half a million. Um, the legal expenses, again, if you want to be legally covered with smart people or not so smart, it's from like 100,000 to maybe half a million. Um, you need to do KYC and AML for every token buyer, every single one of them. Um, again, depending on how well you, you know, because there's no tick box here or I've done the KYC and AML. It's, it can either be better done or, or worse. And so again, the, the better you want to be in that, the, the less problems you're going to have later on with the banks and so on, but the more you'll pay. Um, token listings are another thing that you need to pay for. And there's sort of this, this, this whole um, kind of model also formed with token listings, which is you have about four tiers of exchanges. Um, and the tier four are the, the lowest ones. Those are the, uh, the decentralized exchanges where any token can be listed instantly. It's decentralized, so anyone can, can list it. Um, and every token gets on decentralized exchanges. And it gets there, it gets some liquidity. Um, you might get your initial money out, you're not going to make a profit. Um, but then it's, it's sort of becoming the standard that, you know, if you get on a tier three exchange, which is a centralized exchange, but a really marginal one uh, with little volume, um, then there, again, you might get a bit of profit um, or break even or not even that. And then it's the tier two and tier one exchanges. Tier two exchanges are the more proper ones. If you get a token on tier two exchange, even just because you get it on a tier two exchange, it might, the price might go up three times, two times, three times, and the uh, initial investors can then dump it onto the next person who wants to buy that prices. And then if you're lucky enough to get it to a tier one exchange, which um, you're not gonna get if you don't have a 10 billion market cap probably, um, you know, that's where the big bucks are made. That's where you get the 100x to moon uh, returns. Um, but the token listings, because there's so many tokens, because there's so many ICOs, everyone wants to get on an exchange, um, nobody's going to say, well, I'll, you know, you have to pay to get listed. They'll just say the queue is half a year and you can't wait that long. And then you'll say, well, what can we do? Uh, and they'll say, well, pay us 200,000 and you'll be listed in a week. Um, that's what happens. And then, so you, you're paying for tier two exchanges from 100 to maybe 500,000, and then more proper exchanges, 500 and, and on. Um, so that's another cost that, and you need to get on those exchanges, otherwise the, uh, the token buyers are gonna be extremely unhappy. And that brings us to uh, my closing part, which is what will the future bring? And, all we know is that we don't know, that we're all figuring this out, and the only thing we're sure about is the cycles are short, things are changing quickly. Um, the number one question that I am asking myself is, is the current sentiment, so right now, well maybe the past couple of days, it's, it's improving um, the whole crypto market and, and prices are appreciating again, um, but the question really is, was the negative sentiment in March and, and the majority of April um, because there's this first feedback loop uh, being created, which is that ICOs that raised money a year or two years ago are supposed to deliver products now that people use and either there's no products or there's not a lot, a lot of usage yet. Um, and so we're sort of getting more realistic about how great of an investment opportunity this is or not so great. Um, or was it just because the prices crashed a bit and everyone got scared and then as soon as the prices are going to go back up, everyone's going to start investing again? Um, that's probably the number one question that every ICO right now is asking themselves. Um, the other one that we definitely know about is the regulation is going to get stricter and stricter, um, which is, might be a good thing. Um, well, it definitely is a good thing in some ways, um, but at the same time, we're losing this romantic notion of ICOs that they are democratic, open for all, um, egalitarian, that's just not going to be the case because of regulation. Uh, we know that we have institutional investors coming in. We just don't know how they're going to be coming in, um, which is the next point um, that the VCs, the, what we're seeing right now is that it's not exactly clear that the VCs are going to be buying the tokens. What I think is going to start happening is that the VC money is going to come in and they're going to be investing in tokens to some extent, and then the other part of the investment is going to be the equity investment. And they, they, then they'll still expect the, uh, the, the project to do an ICO and sort of leverage their equity investment through ICO as well. Uh, because what I was sort of expecting when I saw the um, Everpedia deal, if you know about that one, so there was a 
um, Everpedia wanted to do an ICO. Um, they had a hard cap of, I don't know what it was, maybe 20 million. Um, and so they wanted to do an ICO, and then the VC said, we're going to give you the entire hard cap, and then you do an airdrop to EOS token holders. That was the deal. And so I was half expecting that those deals through VCs are going to follow that logic. Right now, we don't see that happening. Um, a lot of VCs are thinking about equity plus tokens, so that's something that we're going to see. Um, another thing that um, I think a lot of people are thinking about is doing an ICO in multiple stages. So uh, maybe saying that you're going to do, um, you're still going to sell maybe 70, 80% of your tokens through an ICO, but maybe you're going to do an initial, um, initial sale of maybe 20, 30%, do a couple of stages of development, get some metrics, do another 30%, and so on. Um, which again is not as simple as it sounds because you have instant liquidity and you have tokens on exchanges and arbitrage opportunities and all sorts of things. Um, but again, that's something that might be happening. And then the last one is the corporate governance, which we all agree with ICO funded projects needs to um, get better. Uh, the question is just how? Uh, because you don't, on one hand, it's the, the, the best way or the most um, right way to do corporate governance in ICO funded project is for, to, to have democratic governance, so every token buyer would have a vote. But um, the problem is that the token buyers are really not that sophisticated right now to be running companies, and they don't have the time to do that. So um, you know, that's a different question. Um, anyway, that's all I had to say uh, for today. And there might be a minute or two for a couple of questions um, if you have them. Uh, but thank you very much for your attention. and. Uh, I hope I didn't put you to sleep, but you uh, woke up after lunch. Thanks. Yeah. What I see, oh, sorry. So you can just uh, invest in SEO, and at any time you can, you can uh, take your money back. Not all of them, but some part of them. So, yeah, it's, it's a difficult question. I think that the problem is that we all agree, it, just, it comes back to corporate governance, I think, all of that stuff um, in ICOs. And I think we all agree it needs to get better. It's just how exactly do you do it, you know? Um, sure, having an instrument that you can invest and then if things don't go right, you sort of try to get that money back or at least some of it is a nice thing. But, um, you know, democracy is the, be is the worst possible system out there except everything else. Um, and corporations usually are not run democratically um, for a reason uh, because they're more effective that way. And so on principle, I agree with a lot of that stuff. I think it's, it's right. It's just how to do it well and efficiently. Um, and right now, if you have, if about the, you know, the future of the company is going to be decided based on, on the five or 10,000 um, token buyers from the ICO, uh, I don't think you can have a successful project. Uh, but on principle, I agree, yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of walking. <laughs> There's some lawyers in this room who might be better able to answer that. Um, I'm not authorized to give either investment or legal advice. Um, it's some. I mean, what I can tell you is that some of it is obviously the, the token model, um, how you what how the token is used in whatever you're developing, um, so that it actually has this utility value. Um, that's that's one thing, but also SEC. Um, it was maybe a, two months ago, um, said that the utility token can only be a utility token if the product or a service that you can get with the token is available within one year of the ICO. So there's this 
um, time limit that the SEC put on that as well. So, because if you're buying a token and you can only spend that token as a utility um, in three years, that's not really utility. You're investing in developing something. Um, so that's another thing, but there's a hundred others that um, I'm not so familiar, and we just follow the uh, lawyer's advice. This depends also on the jurisdiction, right? Yeah, that as well. Depends on where the, the organization that issues the um, tokens is based, and you know, are you so something that might be classified as a security in the US might not be in Europe or might not be in um, Japan, and so on. Yeah? There's no bulletproof solution. One really simple solution is don't have a hard cap. That will help a lot. Uh, don't put a hard cap on your ICO, which means that everyone who wants to participate in the ICO will get in. And which also means you're not leaving any money on the table and you're basically getting um, all the money that's interested. But at the same time, that means that there's no people left outside the door um, and so there won't be so much demand on once it hits the exchanges and I think that's a big reason why uh, we don't see, we see hard caps. Uh, yeah. You cannot have a hard cap and it's like over evaluated, in fact it may like, uh, dilute massively. I mean it may work opposite. If you, if you don't have a hard cap, you mean? Uh, yes. Yeah, but that's why I think it's a, it's a... Yeah, but then it will dilute, so there will be also like a huge fluctuation. Sure, every, I mean, all the tokens will have a fluctuation just because it's, it's human psychology. And, you know, even, even um, in the equity market with the shares, uh, we have fluctuations. And I don't think Wall Street is an efficient market or a rational market either. So you, 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 let's forget about rational um, behavior and expectation. But, um, you know, it, 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 it's at least less volatile than the crypto market. So, yeah, but is there a solution for that? Probably not. Yeah, sure. And also what ICOs are doing is that they're going to limit how much uh, one individual buyer can buy um, and they're going to have lockup periods and all of that kind of stuff. So go to exchange, uh, you know, do the white test. Yeah, uh, but do all of that and try to raise money. Yeah, if it's a stellar, if it's an all-star project um, backed by Vitalik. <laughs> yeah, uh, we ran out of time, right? Thank you very much.